The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome again on behalf of the Northern and Southern California sections of the PJ of America. We welcome you to our California Nevada chat here on Juneteenth. And, and as we've done and have been doing uh, since the middle of March, pretty much early April, you know, our goal is to continue to provide information that's that's relevant and really important uh, to what's happening to us on with to us and with us on a day to day basis as we navigate uh, COVID-19 and, and these days also a very dynamic uh, social environment. You know, it's really an honor to do this and thanks to our, our co-host, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Southern California PGA, Tom Addis, Assistant Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Southern California PGA, Nikki Gatch, and, and our support team that we, that we don't see, but they're there. And, and if you can see us, that means they're doing their thing. And that's uh, Bryce Siever, Caitlin Doyle, and, and Tyler Miller. Uh, thank you so much for helping us uh, broadcast, if you will, on a weekly basis. Our speakers today, and uh, we have Barry Deach, who's the championship director for the 2020 PGA, um, and uh, certainly has a lot to talk about this one so far. Doesn't look like the original plan by any means, Barry, that's for sure. Uh, Jeff Jensen, Jeff Jensen, the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America Southwest Regional Representative. Jeff, thanks for being back with us uh, one more time. And uh, Craig Kessler, the Director of Government Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association. We're, we're at that time where certainly a lot has ha this uh, has happened again in the past 24 hours with a, a state order coming down from Governor Newsom. So we'll get into more detail for that. But for the moment, I would like to introduce our Northern California PGA uh, Section President, Didi Moriarty. Didi? Uh, good morning, Len. Uh, Barry, great to see you. Thanks for being on. And Jeff, thank you. So. Um, I'm uh, really looking forward to all the information today, uh, uh, Craig, from you too. And, uh, you know, things are changing, especially with the face mask order. So uh, it's all uh, coming into this strange world, but uh, most interested in hearing Barry talking about the PGA and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you, Didi. Uh, Tom, some opening comments, please. Yeah. Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's uh, nice to be with you again on a Friday chat. Uh, it's nice that this is a regular occurrence, uh, and uh, we plan to keep these going uh, as long as uh, you would like, and appreciate both Barry and Jeff being here, and as always, uh, Craig, uh, and uh, you'll hear about a lot of new developments, as uh, has been mentioned, especially with face coverings and how that affects everything, and uh, and with the activities that are uh, that are ongoing, the openings that are out there, uh, the risks that are involved, you'll you'll get a full picture of that uh, this morning. And uh, appreciate Bryce and Nikki and Tyler and Caitlin. Uh, Kevin Fitzgerald's with us also. Uh, Craig Kessler's partner in regards to government relations with the SCGA, and we appreciate that. And uh, Nikki uh, will be handling if we have any questions. Uh, and I know that you'll be reminded of the chat box and the question box uh, that you have access to. Uh, and if you have any questions, Nick, Nikki will monitor those questions uh, for the speakers. So uh, again, thank you for being here. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, this time would like to introduce our section president from Southern California, uh, Mr. Tony Latendre. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you. And uh, just wanted to Take a minute to uh, to echo everybody's sentiment. It's uh, nice kind of going last because everybody's gotten all the thank yous out of the way. They've recognized everybody that's on the call. So I just get to say, have a great call and uh, hope everybody's doing well. And Craig, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say after what's going on in Sacramento. So uh, thanks very much for the time and good morning, everyone. Thanks, Tony and Len. Let's okay, go. thank you. Thank you, Dee, Tony, and Tom. And uh, as has been mentioned, as we all know at this point, there's been so much activity. And uh, yesterday, Governor Newsom mandated face coverings in common and public indoor spaces and outdoors when physical distancing is not possible. There has been a surge in numbers uh, reported and diagnosed uh, uh, pretty much across the country, if not across the world to some extent in the past 
a couple of weeks. So a lot of caution there in Washoe County, which is our particular uh, portion of Nevada in the Northern California section, health officials are urging businesses to mandate employees and customers uh, to wear masks, not yet required, but certainly encouraged, is certainly encouraged as the feeling is there, there's not enough yet to get to a requirement, but uh, as you can hear and see, no doubt everything is being monitored uh, on a moment to moment basis. So uh, we have a lot of information uh, diverse today, but all germane, particularly to what we're talking about. So I would like to introduce uh, Barry Deach, our 2020 PGA Championship Director. Uh, Barry is a Minnesota native, and I met Barry just a, a little more than two years ago um, in person at Bell Reef as we were a future site host for the, uh, uh, we were there for the 2018 PGA uh, at Bell Reef in St. Louis, which was just a, an amazing success and have been working with Barry and his team pretty much since then in coordinating the plans uh, for this year. And as we've said uh, up until about 90 days ago, the plans don't look like anything, the plans that, that are in place uh, at the moment. So. Uh, Barry, thank you for being with us to say it's been uh, crazy is, is no question and understatement. Uh, the, the dealings with the cities and negotiating COVID-19 and the backup plan and the backup plan to the backup plan and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I, I'll also mention this, Barry, thanks are in order because uh, some may know, some may not know that Barry has lived here for uh, almost about 18 months now, so away from home with periodic visits. Uh, to see uh, his wife and family, and uh, that just adds to the stress sometimes. But Barry, Barry, thank you so much, and anything you, you can share with us is very welcome. Thanks, I appreciate it, Len. Uh, Dee Dee, so great to hear your voice, actually, it's been a while. So uh, yeah, it, it, I'm just thinking, going back to August of uh, 2018, when we all met at Bell Reeve and had a wonderful dinner and started talking about what the 2020 PGA Championship was gonna be, and uh, you know, you go from the 100th uh, PGA Championship celebration, which was you know, really monumentous for us, uh, an extraordinary championship there in St. Louis. And then, you know, you go immediately to what really this championship uh, <laughs> has been a championship of firsts. Uh, if you think that we're, you know, playing on the only six municipal, true municipal golf course uh, for you know, men's major ever since men's, men's majors began, um, here in the United States, um, even to the venue and, and our gala, those that you attended our gala launch in March of last year was a first time ever event, uh, really kind of, so you go through all the first that we were planning <clears throat> relative to even the design of the experience on Harding Park, uh, to the fact that we were going to be the first, um, uh, no parking, really public parking, all transit, uh, related championship. Uh, just on and on number of firsts and then suddenly we you know we as the world changed in March uh, for all of us uh, we're still on that road of everything's new <laughs> and a lot more firsts uh, right down to the first men's major that's going to be played ever spectatorless in the world so you put that kind of pressure in addition to but here's the great thing um, all of the additional firsts that really this has become a video led championship that ability to broadcast to the world, which still represents over 160 some odd countries and territories around the world, reaching a half a billion households for over 100, probably 150 hours. We're not totally sure yet on the finals ESPN hours, but CBS has confirmed theirs. Um, this truly uh, still is a worldwide event um, for the PGA of America. Uh, it will be our longest running PGA championship from the first tee shot to the last putt. Um, and for San Francisco and for Harding Park. And so uh, it's been extraordinary. Um, and our first sort of, uh, again, first back to the moon in California is first time in San Francisco. Um, so it's been a fast run of building relationships um, that will start not only with this event, but starting for the next you know, decade leading into the 32 Ryder Cup. So everything that we've done uh, with the help of Len and the Northern Cal PGA section to the city and county of San Francisco to Tom Smith and the TPC group out at the Harding Park to Will Hutter, who's on our group at the Olympic Club. Um, you know, it has been an extraordinary, very fast, very filled fast uh, preparation for this championship. And then it's now been um, 
a whole new ball game. But that, uh, what we're most excited about is I think the, the visual, the championship itself, in compared to, I'd say, the events running up to August, um, the uniqueness of Harney Park, the Monterey Cypress trees, the amount of cameras as compared to what you may have seen in Colonial and we'll see at the Travelers this weekend. Um, you know, it's just a, a much larger uh, television production, especially with ESPN coming in for the first time. But I'll just, I'll take one small example and then I'll get into more of a COVID, I'll finish with the COVID situation. Um, typically our onsite media center is upwards of the size of somewhere between 34,000 to 40,000 square feet, typically with seat of 265 plus people. Uh, we would typically credential over 800 media representatives. Uh, we'll now go to a media center um, less than, I guess, just under 20,000 square feet. Um, that will seat only 35 desks. And if you look at total credentials for the week, uh, total persons on site from essential personnel to players, the caddies, to then, you know, all the other uh, groups that have to be on site. We total credentials will be under 1,500 people on site. Um, so on any given day of golf, Tom is probably entertaining that uh, as far as just players and people that are coming to eat uh, on a normal pre-COVID day. So pretty extreme change. Um, I'm so I'll switch over to COVID now. Uh, as of Monday, I mean, many of you learned and the world learned and it was leaked about the PGA Championship going spectatorless. Uh, we did receive word uh, late this week um, that was our plans were approved and we call that our draft of wealth and health, health, health wellness because uh, safety to the CDC is to stay home. So we were really excited about the fact that we got that approved this week. Um, and we'll be releasing our official news release on the morning and our time when Eastern um, in cooperation with the city and county of San Francisco and the state of California. Uh, we've got a few more things to uh, cover with them as far as the health department is concerned, but uh, nothing that's unreasonable that, that we can't meet or have more plans. So I would say the biggest thing is it continues to all be new. Um, you know, we've never kind of charted in this way before. We've never had a men's, you know, spectators PGA championship. We've never worked under a COVID situation like all of you. So if anything, um, every day has been a changing day um, and we keep uh, changing our plans slightly, but I would say within the next two weeks, those plans will be pretty much solidified uh, at the end of the day. And, and we kind of get excited about making the final production for the PGA championship. Um, if people ask me, you know, what do you take from the situation? And I'd say more than anything, I'm very excited about what the broadcast is going to be. And so we as an organization have been really working with our headquarters team about sort of that, the importance of the new whys about what this is. It's not a standard PGA championship. The metrics are different. So how do we really uh, build something and, and build the excitement around it? And I think our, is I, I'll frame it this way. Um, you all represent on the ground the love of the game day in and day out. And so our positioning outside of all the wonderful things that uh, from coaching to all the things that we dispel every day as an organization, I think it's going to be an extraordinary celebration of the game and the love of the game. And um, and why and how important that is as we come out of this COVID situation. So it has been, if you take a communications plan that was planned, you throw it out, and we have been working very hard at uh, redeveloping that, uh, as well as ensuring that our digital side is the most robust it can be, because um, if there was a metric on this championship, it is going to be uh, both the engagement, number of eyeballs, uh, and our social media digital reach on top of it. Um, so our whole media center has been a completely turned up uh, and over virtual media center. And so working towards what probably will maybe become a new uh, standard for how we run our media operations 
for PGA Championships. So it's been an extraordinary time of change, but I think what we're most excited about is our plan being approved by the city and county of you know, San Francisco and moving forward on those final plans for COVID um, and conducting the great championship. So I'll kind of leave the rest of the time for questions because those generally provide the greatest amount of dialogue. So Len, if there's anything more you want me to touch on, that's kind of the uh, top line. So thank you, Barry. And you know, kudos to to you, of course, for the endless conversations and and navigating, literally navigating the scenario and the team as well with Everett and Chase and and Ali and Francis uh, and uh, and on and on, which is which has been great. So Barry, what will there will there be, or do, do we know any uh, quarantining or testing of the players coming in? And what, well, something that's very interesting is that the Barracuda is the week before the PGA and you know we'll have we'll have many players here right in uh, Truckee at Old Greenwood for the Barracuda and then many I, I would hope are certainly some just driving down to San Francisco for the PGA so are you aware of what what the protocol is going to be for the players and the caddies? Yeah so it's uh we've been working uh lockstep with the PGA Tour ever since since March so to be quite honest, we're following uh, the strict protocols that the tour has, and now they're going into their second week. Um, and we get that intel uh, through Kerry Hag, our chief championship officer, about how plans are slightly um, changed week to week, both to the PGA Tour and the players and the caddies. Um, oftentimes it's described as a bu bubble um, to the point where, but everybody within that bubble for the protection of the players and caddies is pretty strict. Um, and minimizing as many people that come into that uh, bubble uh, for the players and caddies. So yes, uh, we'll be utilizing the PGA Tour testing, which is the mobile testing team uh, of Drug Free Sport, and they'll be at the Barracuda Championship and then simply start with us in the week. We'll all have some additional um, testing through our partner, our medical service partner here for this championship, UC, UCSF. And uh, so those would be some back end with that, but. Um, we've submitted a 40 page plus page document to the city and county of San Francisco and the state of California, which kind of outlined everything relating to the competition, uh, namely around the players. And then we would, and we basically said, you know, these have to be met in order to have a PGA championship. <laughs> and then, uh, if those were approved, it would all be basically applicable to anybody else. So it was a pretty, pretty detailed plan. Um, relative to anybody that may come in contact uh yes so to answer your question there is pretty strict testing from a COVID perspective daily thermal readings and questionnaires will be conducted uh, throughout the entire week probably for two weeks actually the week leading into the championship um our credential system has gone to a full badge uh and colored lanyard system uh minimizing movement like people uh the broadcasts all the broadcast partners in the compound um, they have their own uh, COVID testing program and they're hoping we're in a two hour session with them prior to the colonial about how they're maneuvering throughout the country with two separate teams working with MedCorp and COVID. Um, they have extraordinary strict policies and a great program um, where they have two teams and then back up to those two teams traveling around the country uh, for the protection of COVID. So it's, it's pretty exhausting, yes. Uh, Barry, yeah, thank you, and and you know, congratulations to the Colonial team for for accomplishing what they did, particularly being first ones out of the box for the year, and and knowing it's certainly under the microscope. Um, Barry, from our point of view, it seemed like it was a tremendous success. Not only were from the spectators, but you know, us in the golf industry, the passion we have is great to see the players. But an overall success, given the circumstances, and any takeaways. Uh, lessons learned uh, at, at Colonial? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, a formalized document of review that we was forwarded to us um, through Terry Hag and the PGA Tour. Um, I'm hopefully going to jump on a call in the next couple of weeks with that championship director with the help of Dan Dillon, our general chairman here, um, and said so that they were generally pretty pleased. I think we were probably, like anybody else, um, analyze it more from a broadcasting standpoint. So I think there were some lessons learned there. Um, but with anything, I think the message I heard back was, you know, if one, everybody was kept safe, there was no COVID positive cases. Um, 
and they you know learned a lot. So I mean, for us, any of the learnings that came out were fairly benign and more physical in nature and had to do with access and credentials and kind of like that. But I'd say you know kudos to the PGA Tour who had to jump off with the first protocols. If anything that we're seeing is two things. One, each week leading into the Colonial, there was a little bit of a lessening of the restrictions. And, I'm, and I say that more on the, it's sort of like on the fringes. Policies might have still been in place, but they were sort of softened a little bit. Um, I think we saw that coming out of the Colonial. We're seeing that from the travelers and they had success you know, for week two, that there were zero cases from a player and caddy perspective. I think only on the ferry tour, there was two positives. Um, so if anything, in the protection of bubble and how the players move around and uh, we will, you know, there will be a chartered flight from here to the next step to the window. Um, I've been in contact with Chris Huff, the Barracuda Championship, pretty much on a weekly basis, comparing notes. Um, interestingly enough, parting and our infrastructure that we had planned sets up extraordinarily well for COVID. Uh, it's, you know, so it's a semi-island surrounded by a lake. Um, and the infrastructure that we had in place, we were able to uh, reuse. Um, so for what was going to be part of the grand merchandise PGA shops facility, which is a very our, one of our top two biggest structures on site, um, the half of that will be used for the player locker room and dining, um, and then a separate tent facility for the caddies. It will probably be the biggest locker room on the PGA Tour. <laughs> So more than enough to put all of the player services into a facility with complete um, over six foot spatial, COVID spatial uh, with outdoor decking. And um, so that's what we've been pleased about. I think I've heard from a couple of tournament directors on the tour where that's a burden because clubhouses don't necessarily set up for that kind of spatial uh, configuration where we've been able to do it with uh, reuse of another facility. So, so far, um, if anything, over the last week and a half, we've been taking things down um, and we're not having to build actually been kind of a surprise reversal of some of the challenges that maybe the other companies have had. Yeah, Barry, thank you. That is, say the contrast is interesting. Moving from Bell Reeve to Beth Page, if we think of total acreage of both those properties and then to Harding Park, the talk was how are we going to get all that to fit and now to hear you say that's actually working to our advantage is just is just amazing, it's just amazing. Yeah. yeah yeah absolutely so Barry, with the move of the championship and and covid when harding park did reopen everyone that was playing was literally exposed to tour conditions and and just amazing so play has been going on and the response has been great I would imagine right, that at some point Hardy Park is going to need to, to close again to put in the, the final touches, yes? Yeah, so what we're hearing is um, that the rough is quite thick. So on social media, you maybe have seen that through the TPC postings. Um, golf course is primed. The Kevin Tehan and the grounds maintenance and Omar have done a wonderful job of continuing to sustain the golf course in championship condition um, in close communications with Harry Hay. Uh, so all of that is ready to go. We're starting now fly you know, booking a flyovers and the whole bit. Um, the golf course will close at business day on Friday, July 17th. So it gets a good couple of weeks of rest. Um, and I think that'll be important for the greens, um, as they really ramp up, uh, the championship readiness, uh, beginning on August 3rd. Great, Barry. Thank you. So I'll, I'll toss it to Nikki. Nikki, any any questions for Barry? Thanks, Lynn. Yes, we do have two, Barry. Um, how will this uh, affect the Northern California section members that have uh, signed up to volunteer? Yeah, Lynn, I'll give that to you. Do you want to answer that question? Well, uh, our, our responsibilities are going to be minimal at best. As, as Barry mentioned earlier, there are only going to be a limited number of credentials issued during the week uh, in order to meet and adhere to the protocol. So, so though unfortunate, um, most of our responsibilities have pretty much gone away. And uh, we're, we're, I say it's unfortunate as the host, but we are still grateful that 
that we will be, uh, we are hosting at the event, we'll go on. So as soon as we have the official word, uh, we'll get that out to everyone, but, but it's a far, far, far uh, reduced responsibility, to be honest. Yeah, just to put it in context, um, normal PG of America staff, officials, officers, board of directors, um, that number is usually somewhere between about 150 and 160 that would travel to a normal PGA championship. For August at Harding, we are under 30 people. So if that gives you any kind of extreme, um, and it's vital that the number stays under 1500 on site, and that includes all working person, essential personnel, broadcast players and caddies, uh, families currently, um, currently as it stands, uh, could be changed. Again, this, this is week to week, it could be slightly changed, um, but I don't see that necessarily happening because one of the things that we're seeing with San Francisco, as you all know, um, and including with the Bay Area in general, but San Francisco is probably the most conservative um, in moving through the phases and has continues to be and the monitoring of that seems to be really and having the success from that, to be quite honest. Um, so that's really been affecting our plans relative to who will be allowed on site. And even we've had, I'll give you an example, scoring has changed its location, I think, three times. And we're now back to kind of original location outside of the clubhouse because it became too difficult to mix people that were not COVID testing specifically that can get into the bubble versus really protecting the players and the caddies in a very physical way when it comes to exposure. Um, so it's a, it's, it is a very minimum, minimum, minimal, minimal, minimal people on site. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more, um, since no on-site merchandise shop, will championship logo merchandise be available online? Yes, currently I don't know the full robust. You could go to fanatics.com um, to get merchandise now. And I don't have the final word, but yes, there is a plan and discussions with some companies, third party companies to help us um, do that. Um, all the merchandise is sitting in warehouses in Chicago as we speak. Um, and we're just waiting for the final work. But a lot of it will probably go through the Fanatics page, which you can currently find today, or there may be even a separate program um, that will be launched in partnership with the championship. I have not heard the specifics yet. For, um, uh, for PGA members, Barry, will that be online on pga.org in the golf shop or will? Yeah, good question. I don't have an answer to that, but I'll uh, follow up and make sure Len um, gets the answer. Great, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we have for now, Len. Okay, Nikki, thank you. Barry, thank you. And I, I hope you can stay on uh, for, for the remainder of our session and again, congratulations, and, and, and you know, we're having the championship. That's a big deal, and everything that's, all the work's been done, as you mentioned, Dan Dillon, and, and certainly Tom and Andy uh, and Patrick and the team out at Harding Park as well to, to bring this to fruition, and, and we're very grateful for that. So thanks, Barry, and as I said, I hope you can join us. Right? Happy to, yep. You know, as we've gone through this process, uh, we've talked many times about the industry coming together and uh, can be no greater example than the Golf Course Superintendents Association uh, of America. And uh, Jeff Jensen is with us this morning. Uh, Jeff is the Southwest Region uh, representative and also a participant in CAG, the California Alliance for Golf. So uh, Jeff, thank you again for being back with us, not, you know, not only as a member of CAG, but also as an industry partner and everything that the GCSAA has, has done in complement to the back to golf guidelines and keeping us informed from a different angle, keeping us informed from an operator angle and all the safety protocols uh, that are in place. And so, uh, Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Len. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I'd just like to start by saying thank you to all the PGA members, uh, Southern California, Northern California, North Northern Nevada, who are on this call. Uh, your efforts are greatly appreciated. Uh, what you guys have done uh, from the operational side to keep uh, our golfers safe and to get us back out on the golf courses has been uh, extremely instrumental. So uh, uh, a big thank you to everybody out there. Just uh, it's a team effort from all of our organizations, uh, California Alliance for Golf, our regional golf associations, PGA, GCSA, 
golf course owners and many others to uh, get this up and running and to keep it up and running uh, as we could be going through a second breakout here uh, at any point. So uh, before I get into the COVID, uh, uh, I just want to follow up on Barry's excellent talk there on the PGA Championship. Uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention our guys, uh, our GCSA members on the ground at Harding Park up there, our three agronomists, uh, Almar Valenzuela, Kevin Tehan, and Jeff Blavanovich. Um, the three of those guys have been, uh, you know, just doing excellent work through all of this. Uh, it's going to be pretty easy for me to remember where I kind of, uh, where this COVID-19 broke out because I was actually at Harding Park the day that uh, it all kind of hit the fan up there. Uh, I was doing a visit up there with the guys and seeing the course. So uh, that's kind of where I'm going to remember when all, all the news of uh, the COVID-19 really started to break out. So, uh, but those guys are doing a tremendous job. Uh, and as Barry indicated with the PGA, uh, you know, members there, we typically have a much larger presence as well at the major championships. Uh, uh, our typically our board of directors uh, will have, uh, you know, upwards of sometimes upwards of 100 volunteers on the maintenance side of it, which we did at the U.S. Open at Pebble last year. Uh, those numbers are on both sides are going to be extremely decreased this year as well. Uh, we're kind of actually waiting to hear back on uh, what the exact plan is going to be now from our CEO, Red Evans, on that. But uh, uh, while Barry was speaking, I was just uh, actually doing some texts back and forth between uh, Kevin Tehan up at Harding and myself. So, again, those guys are doing an excellent job up there. It's going to be a great event. Uh, it's going to be a little unusual without the fans. But, uh, again, uh, you know, we appreciate the, you know, the cooperation of GCSA and the PGA and uh, glad we can be part of putting on such a super event. Uh, we know the golf is going to be tremendous. Uh, just as it picked up at Colonial last week, uh, those guys didn't miss a beat. And uh, it's great that golf's back and it shows what we can do from a social distancing perspective. And uh, we're the first ones back on board, basically, from a professional sports uh, side. So uh, it's great to see. So uh, moving into the COVID-19 updates a little bit. I know Craig Kessler is going to be on here, so I'll let him handle California. I know he'll have a lot to say about that. Uh, but just some brief updates from uh, Nevada. Uh, earlier this week, our governor, Steve Sisolak, uh, held a press conference. Uh, he uh, declared that uh, the state of Nevada is not yet ready for phase three. Uh, we are hoping in phase three that we might be able to go back to dual rider carts. Uh, that is what the uh, Nevada Golf Alliance lobbyist has been working on. Uh, as of right now, again, Governor Sisolak decided not to move to phase three. Uh, he indicated the virus will obviously tell us when it's okay to move to that. Uh, as Len was talking about earlier, we've had an uptick in Nevada as well. Uh, not as severe as you've seen probably in California, obviously not anywhere close to Florida, Arizona, or Texas. Uh, but we have had a slight uptick in cases, uh, obviously some of that due to testing. And we've had a slight increase in hospitalizations, uh, nothing to get overly concerned about. But I think the governor is probably being, uh, you know, a little bit smart on this one and, uh, you know, uh, doing the right thing as, uh, you know, phase two is, has most of our stuff in Nevada open. Uh, our golf courses are moving forward. Um, it's a, a extremely busy May. Uh, most everyone I've talked to in the state has been doing record rounds, especially in the southern part of the state for the, uh, the month of May. So uh, obviously the single rider cart has been the, uh, you know, the, the most difficult thing to deal with. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, it puts a lot of pressure on the golf course, a ton of compaction, uh, you know, four carts per group. Uh, so that's been difficult from that side. And then obviously it's, it's pretty simple from the operational side. It's a, a lot of abuse on the golf carts. Uh, it takes a ton of staff to sanitize them and clean them. Uh, so that, that's, that's been the big issue. And that's something that the, uh, you know, we've certainly been working on as a golf alliance moving forward there. So um, that'll be the issue coming forward. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, Governor Sisolak did announce that uh, they're going to have a special legislative session in Nevada. Uh, that was something that was kind of up in the air for a while, but they've he has not announced a date, but that is probably going to happen within the next two weeks. Uh, so he'll call everybody together, get them up in Carson City there, and uh, they'll be, begin to talk about the current uh, $888 million budget shortfall, uh, which is this year, which actually the fiscal year ends June 30th. So uh, they'll be talking about that. And just as importantly, they're going to be talking about the $1.3 billion forecasted shortfall for next year, which starts July 1st. Uh, uh, of the approximate 888 million right now that we're short this year, uh, approximately half of that is going to be covered by the rainy day fund uh, that has been set aside by the state. Um, a little over 400 million will go towards that. Uh, they've also put in obviously a number of uh, things statewide, furloughs, layoffs, uh, and a number of other stuff to help make up for the current shortfall. Um, as we start to the legislators start to discuss what uh, you know next year is going to look like. Uh, while the governor hasn't exactly come out, he, he's not wanted to raise taxes in the past. 
uh, but he actually came out on record the other day saying that that is something that is not off the table right now. So uh, I'm sure as Craig will explain in California a little bit out here, somebody's going to have to pay for what's going on here. So uh, I would expect to see a, a number of tax increases in the state of Nevada coming up to uh, help alleviate some of these budget shortfalls uh, uh, and, and some of the you know troubles that Nevada is obviously having from uh, you know having our economy uh, you know shut down for over 60 days. Uh, we obviously have a particularly large emphasis on gaming and tourism here. So unemployment numbers are high. Um, it's going to be a long-term uh, difficulty for the state here moving forward, obviously. Um, as I heard somebody say the other day, I, they, they, they said it's sometimes it's not the earthquake, but it's the fires that get you. And, uh, you know, we'll see if that's, uh, that holds true moving forward. But uh, we certainly should have concerns about the economy moving into the fall season, uh, particularly in the southern part of the state and uh, other parts where we get a lot of tourism. So. Uh, again, that's a little bit about what's going on in Nevada, I think. And uh, again, just a, a great job by our PGA professionals uh, up in the north as well, up there in Reno, just doing a great job of, of uh, you know, social distancing and getting our golf golfers out on the golf course. So uh, again, appreciate that of the, the COVID side of it. So that's kind of the local update. Uh, as far from a, as from a national perspective, GCSA continues to uh, produce materials uh, along with the PGA of America. Uh, our Back to Golf series uh, has been updated. Some videos just recently came out, which I know you're all aware of. So the two sides have really worked together on this to put out some outstanding materials to educate uh, uh, both sides of the industry, uh, operations side of it and the maintenance side of it. Uh, so we're keeping our employees safe, we're keeping our guests safe, and we're able to uh, you know, try to withstand some of the economic uh, fallout from this and get golfers out on the golf course. Uh, we continue to lobby as well. Uh, one of the big things we've been obviously lobbying on is the inclusion of 501c6s and 501c7s and a potential round of relief uh, that could be coming up. Uh, the HEROES Act, which was passed through the House uh, last month, uh, will not be passed through the Senate. Uh, we're obviously aware of that, but uh, 501c6s and 7s were included in that. We hope that if there is a future relief bill, something that uh, both sides can agree on, uh, that will be included in that as well, um, you know, to be part of the uh, PPP efforts if, if those are so inclined to uh, be included in the next round of relief. So a lot up in the air there, but uh, it's something that GCSA, we have a federal lobbyist on the ground, Bob Helen in Washington, D.C. He continues to lobby on those issues uh, as well as many others concerning COVID-19. So again, it's a team effort out there and uh, we appreciate your support. And uh, thank you again for having me on the call today. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to take it. If not, uh, I'll be glad to turn it back over to Len and uh, Nikki. Thank you, Jeff. That was a tremendous amount of information. And again, thank you for all the work uh, personally and, and uh, as an association coming together. Um, so I, I do have to agree and you know, kudos to Kevin Tehan and the team. They were on it right away, even, even 18 months, 20, 21 months ago. Uh, in getting Harding Park prepared, it was evident immediately, and 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 uh, what what a what a joy to watch uh, the way it was done so professionally in crafting what was, was a tremendous layout to to tour standards, which bringing back tour standards actually. So Jeff, as I as I asked Barry, any takeaways uh, from the maintenance side from Colonial? Uh, obviously, just very impressed with what they uh, you know what they, the product that they put together down there. Um, golf course looked beautiful and, uh, you know, with, they, they had some high temperatures down there for June, obviously in the nineties, uh, had a little bit of wind here and there as well, but, uh, you know, they did a, ter you know, a terrific job of doing that, uh, putting it together and also maintaining the safety, uh, uh, you know, protocols there for the maintenance staff. Uh, and again, these guys are doing this just as you guys are on the operations side. They are doing this very short handed. Um, you know, the volunteer aspect is just not available to us right now. Uh, as your PGA members volunteer for all these events, our GCSA members volunteer for these as well. Uh, at any given tour stop, you're gonna have, uh, you know, 30 to 50 guys typically that are, you know, top-notch superintendents from around the country or from around the region, at least in the Texas, uh, you know, in the colonial aspect there, they would have had some of the best superintendents in Texas on that staff during the week. And they're, uh, you know, they're having to do it on a, on a short staff without that talent out there. So. Um, that's the biggest takeaway that I, that I have seen is that, you know, these guys are still able to do it on a smaller crew, uh, still be able to produce tour like conditions. And, uh, you know, that's something I expect to see up in San Francisco with, uh, you know, Kevin and, and Jeff and Almar as well. I know they're going to be able to get it done. And, uh, that's what we, uh, that's what the superintendents do. They're, they're creative, they're hardworking and they find solutions to problems in a quick manner. Very much so, Jeff. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is science meets magic. 
uh, most of the time uh, in the superintendent world. And thank you for that, Jeff. Nikki, any questions uh, for Jeff? I don't have any at this time, Lynn. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Nikki, thank you. So, Jeff, thanks again for being with us. And, and I hope you can stay should some things come up uh, during the session. And if not, I will certainly get them to you after that. So, th thanks for being part of us again, Jeff. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. And I'll stay on the call. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up from uh, the Southern California Golf Association, our Director of Governmental Affairs, uh, Mr. Craig Kessler. And Craig is pretty much our leader through our California Alliance for Golf uh, discussions as well. So, Craig, once again, a full plate, a full plate of news uh, around the state, around Nevada, around the country. So it's all yours. Thank you, Len. Thank you, Tom. And, and thank you, Jeff, for lightening my load today. Much appreciated. Uh, first, I'd like to tag onto something that Jeff mentioned about single rider carts and double occupancy carts. Uh, California is a little bit different than Nevada in the sense that double occupancy carts are permitted in the statewide order uh, with a partition down the middle and with the requirement that, that the two persons sharing the cart don't touch each other's equipment or never get onto the other side of the cart. However, um, most of the counties in the states have, have uh, superseded that with stricter rules about carts and most of the counties I'm aware of, for example, Los Angeles, San Diego, and Ventura in the southern part of the state uh, only permit single rider carts except for members of the same household. But as I read it, Orange County and Riverside County, at least as of today, do hew to the statewide order. So they are permitted uh, on that sort of basis. We'll see how long that, that lasts. As Jeff also mentioned, Nevada is seeing an uptick in COVID-19 cases, uh, not on the level of Arizona or Alabama or Texas, uh, but a little bit less than California. And I'm gonna guess that that and some really sort of unfortunate things that happened in Orange County led the governor yesterday to come a little bit off of his position of broad deference to the counties in making the rules uh, in that he instituted a statewide standard that's mandatory uh, for all of the 58 counties to follow with respect to uh, face coverings. Ironically, and I'm going to, instead of uh, the SCGA put out, many of you received the alert that we put out within about an hour of the governor's edict, um, and it's very complicated, but breaking it down and what it means in practical terms for a golf operation, it means that in all counties, and that would include Orange and Riverside uh, County, which have been a little bit more liberal than the others on all matters golf, all matters COVID-19 for that matter, it means that in what we're referring to as common areas, mass, uh, face coverings are required. So when you're enjoying the new in-house dining per new rules, when you're up near the clubhouse, when perhaps before you tee off or what we refer to as common areas, and that's the rule right now in Los Angeles County and will largely remain the rule now that the state has off, has acted, uh, face coverings are required, but they are not required on the golf course by the by what the governor did yesterday. So once you tee off and, and, and play 18 holes, the face coverings are not required. Now, there are some jurisdictions, for example, the city of Los Angeles, which added a level of, of regulation over and above the county, which added a level of regulation over and above the state. Those face coverings are technically required while on the golf course as well. We've been a little bit hopeful that when the county of LA updates its uh, golf order, which we hope happens today, if it doesn't happen today, it'll happen one day next week, to permit a number of relaxations involving practice areas, group play, group lessons, junior programs, et cetera. We have been sort of hopeful that the city of Los Angeles might go to the more expansive uh, county uh, rules regarding face coverings, but Given what the governor did and what he said in doing it, uh, that I wouldn't I wouldn't count on that necessarily moving forward. Now, does this mean that the governor has come off of his position of handling COVID-19 in a federated fashion with maximal deference to local jurisdictions? I don't think so. 
I think this is an exception that proves that rule and, and probably had to do with um, some very disquieting things that happened in Orange County and, and where a uh, public health officer literally, literally resigned uh, because she was getting death threats and quite honestly, and not being treated particularly deferentially by the Board of Supervisors, and they were probably getting the same kinds of constituent pressure. So he, he acted to intervene. And that may be a pattern going forward where a county or two becomes, in the governor's opinion, rogue. That's not my word, that's his. Uh, he may intervene. But for the most part, golf is, continues to perform admirably. My experience has been in, in being contacted by an awful lot of, of Southern California Golf Association clubs is that they are almost a little bit overly meticulous in trying to get down to what the black letter law is on every small thing that they do on the golf courses. And so ironically, unlike a lot of other sectors in the state, where it seems like uh, practitioners are looking for loopholes <laughs> to become more expansive, uh, the golf industry is almost wants to make is almost a little bit reluctant to go back to the first principles I keep directing them to, which are keep in mind that anything and everything you do needs to be a judge needs to be judged by whether you're maintaining strict social distancing and you're maintaining strict social uh, common touch point controls. If you're doing those two things and you're not otherwise violating something specific in your local order or in the state order, then you're probably on solid ground. But I think, uh, I think all the efforts of the organizations represented on this call, I know the joint efforts in Southern California is the SCGA and the SCPGA have partnered on, on uh, all kinds of, in fact, President Tony Latendra is a star in one of those uh, YouTubes that we put out. Um, as we have partnered on, on really pounding the message, particularly because golf was literally the first thing back, which meant that the media had nothing else to report upon. So we were under a great deal of scrutiny. And that is largely, that sort of acculturation has largely maintained for the golf industry. And I think that's a, a good thing because it's going to put us in very good stead as we begin to become nervous about COVID-19 cases ramping up as we are entering a great period of uncertainty as to we know there will be a second wave of the virus because it's a virus, uh, at, but we have no clue as to the severity. And quite honestly, epidemiologists have no clue as to the severity. And there are two schools of thoughts about that, even among the epidemiologists that state that many of the things that we did that were associated with the lockdown will put us in better stead when the second uh, wave hits. And there's another school of thought which holds that we really, since only five or 6% of Americans have been exposed to the virus, and that's a good thing. I don't know about you, I don't wanna get it. That's a good thing, All, but we need to get, but that also means that we're not only, we are nowhere near having the herd immunity that ultimately acts in, this, acts in a very similar fashion to a vaccine. Yes, there's some encouraging news about the vaccine is, perhaps as early as this year. But again, if you listen very closely to those who really understand the subject, the epidemiologists, um, they will tell you that for most of the history of vaccines, they take years to develop. And for those, you know, we're probably most familiar with the AIDS vaccine, uh, and that took uh, more than, that took a decade and a half uh, to be developed. We hope that's not the case here. We could be living with this thing for a very, very long time because we may indeed have to rely upon herd immunity. Jeff gave you a little bit of the fiscal picture out of the state of Nevada. And I'm only, I'm envious. I suppose the state is small, so the tax base is small, but I'm envious of those numbers he came up with because California is looking at a $54 billion deficit at the moment, uh, or another number, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, it's 54 billion if, in the next act of congressional relief for the CARES Act, if Congress moves forward with zero dollars in the package uh, to the nation's states and localities, that's the amount of the deficit we're looking at. If they move to anywhere from the 500 million that's being talked about in the Senate, all the way to the uh, 500 billion, excuse me, all the way to the trillion that's actually in the House bill, then you're looking at a deficit uh, in California of 18 to 31 billion. 
Now, in the history of California, that's not a particularly alarming number, but what makes this particularly troublesome is the fact that uh, it was only, what, 12, 13, 15 weeks ago, we were not only looking at a $20 billion rainy day fund, but we were looking at adding an additional $3 billion to it when we get to the end of this fiscal year, which is in a matter of days uh, from this, but is on June 30th. And now we're now that $20 billion is gone, and we're looking at anywhere from 18 to a 15, $54 billion deficit. Um, those of you on this, I'm probably the person on this call, maybe along with Kevin Fitzgerald, who pays very close attentions to um, municipal budgets, particularly park budgets, because 22% uh, of this state's golf stock is owned by, is owned by municipalities. About 40% of the golf played in this state or more is on municipal systems, and close to 100% of all of our Grow the Game programs and developmental programs occur on that 22% of the state's golf stock. And this fate, whether you're an enterprise fund or a contracted or privatized situation, there can be some layers of protection, but there aren't enough layers of protection to protect those systems from the depredations of what amounts to basically absolutely imploding municipal budgets. So to give you an example of what I mean by what is what is what you know what does that mean in real life, the County of Los Angeles has canceled every one of its programs. Most of those are for kids this year, or on an indefinite basis. Uh, the only things moving forward are those that are fully cost uh, fully supportive in terms of cost recovery, and there are very few programs that amount to that or those, the handful that actually generate revenue, and golf is in that handful. So we should probably be very grateful that municipal golf, at least in those places in this state, where they're in highly packed urban areas and they're successful, um, that they will continue. I wouldn't count on any of the projects that were funded prior going forward, and, I, and obviously there's gonna be a period of time, and all of us on this call understand that golf courses are very capital intensive, and the degree to which you, in the, particularly in the municipal sector, starve them of the revenues necessary, the funds necessary to, to fix that infrastructure over time, whether it's greens, tees, irrigation systems, parking lots, clubhouses, that the farther and farther you fall behind in those efforts, the harder and harder it is to catch up in the future. So that'll be the, the main, will be the main problem from these uh, imploding budgets for the successful systems. For those in parts of the states, uh, particularly in places like Tulare or Stockton or some of those places which are off the beaten path a little bit and, have, and were struggling uh, 15, 16 weeks ago, that you may, we may not see them on the other side of the pandemic. And I think of particular concern to the golf industry is that I think we all know that the little developmental uh, facilities, the little nine hole three pars, the driving ranges, all those kinds of things, have, they've never been profit centers. And this is the kind of time where governments are literally doing triage. Do I close that, that lost leader that may benefit the golf community? Or, or do, I, do I close it and, 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 high, and, and, and keep my fire department intact? Or do I lay off a, or do I discontinue a few positions in the fire department and keep a three par golf course open? So, um, in that regard, uh, you know, we could end up on the other, we will, end, we will end up on the other side of this pandemic at some point. And while there's some silver linings in what we've discovered, as Jeff pointed out from Nevada, I'll say in spades here in California, particularly Southern California, that the shocking thing is just how much the numbers are up on golf universally. And it seems to be going beyond the honeymoon period. We understood when, uh, and I've discovered more than anyone, that when golfers can't golf, they become very crabby. And sometimes when they become crabby sitting at home, they call the government affairs director of their golf association to just to, to explain that crabbiness and why am I not doing more to get them back on the golf course. Uh, so I know they're back on the golf course and that's, that, that's all very good, but that's maintaining beyond that honeymoon period. And I think that's a silver lining for us moving forward. Uh, we can build on that. That's a strength we discovered. That we discovered that perhaps there's a reason why golf has been has been has maintained its popularity. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. And I think we focused a little too much in the last 10 years about the down part of it. But maybe we discovered 
that something's been around for 500 years has a, has a pull within human nature, and we found it out during this crisis. But we also discovered, and while we may have arrived at this particular moment well prepared in that regard, and we, and we really benefited in California from something that Len made clear when he introduced Jeff, is that the, the degree to which we began cooperating and working together across jurisdictional lines and organizational lines in California really put us in excellent position. And to me, it's the, it is the one reason that I've given to the other recreational communities that have contacted me. And they've contacted me because they want to know what it is that golf understood that they didn't because we were the first thing introduced, at least in, in Southern California's 10 counties. We beat out beaches, we beat out parks, we beat out playgrounds, we beat out hiking trails and, and, walking, and walking trails, nature centers. And many of the things that most who don't play golf might have assumed were more amenable to social distancing and coming back on board. And I think the only thing we may have discovered, we're not smarter than they are, except we've been working together so on day one, we, we, came, we understood we had, we had a goal to be that first thing in reintroduced back. We, we made that case and we made it together and there was no dissonance or dissent. And I think we've largely been through that and we're in pretty good stead moving forward, but we're gonna have to begin starting to think and work together to come to terms with the economic detritus uh, that's gonna face us for a period of time and maybe a little bit longer uh, then shorter. Yes, I know we hang on every, every financial statistic that gives us, puts maybe a, cre a little smile on our face, and then the next day it's followed by something which is indicative that yes, we're gonna, we may already be pulling out of this recession, but when you're talking about pulling out of 23, 24% unemployment, it's a long way back. And I think we have to never forget that despite the popularity at the moment, Longer term, golf is something which is a middle class recreational activity and it's dependent upon a strong middle class that feels confident about the future and feels as if that, that, that's they, they are free with their discretionary income. So those, that's sort of my wrap up right now. I wouldn't put too much into what the governor did yesterday. I think it's the exception that proves the rule on the federated approach. Uh, I, but at the same time, it's a little bit of a red flag in the sense that it was spurned on, it was spurred for, animated by, by an uptick in cases, and it was animated a little bit by the fact that persons are getting a little antsy as the weather gets good and we get into summer, they want to get out. Golf is, needs to continue to perform well so that it can survive on the other side should those cases continue to go up and should a second wave be a little bit worse than we think it might be. Um, so with that all over the map presentation, which tends to be my stock in trade, I will uh, Len, Nikki, Tom, yield the floor back to you. And if there are any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Hey, thank you, Craig. And I'd just like to jump on that last point you made uh, Regarding the, the state order from Governor Newsom, I think a couple things are at play there. Um, one is even having talked with our local health officials, the emphasis on social distancing being such a critical component to getting through COVID-19. And uh, as Tom mentioned uh, on a call we had earlier in the week that in some cases we're talking about eight feet to 10 feet uh, instead of six feet and even uh, with with Dr. Mattias here in Solano County, when I was talking to him about group lessons, he said that he said, "Len, just keep them apart, and on windy days, go to ten feet." And when I asked him uh, how big can the can the class be, he said, "Well, it's as as comfortable as you are uh, being loud." So again, the emphasis was on that social distancing. So Craig, uh, to that, I, I have heard some instances of a, of a club opening and then closing based upon their decision of a case or two of COVID in a staff member or even a club member, but yet the counties, and you know, help me here, please, don't necessarily seem to be saying, okay, if we hit this number, we're pulling back. If we hit this number, we're pulling back. It's now just being more cautious, but without that, that threat, if you will, of, re of reducing services. Is that accurate? Well, uh, the club you refer to is in Sacramento County. And my understanding, it's a couple of social members 
who have come down with COVID-19. Uh, there's no evidence that it had anything to do with the golf club, but it's caused a little bit of a, a panic and they've decided to err on the side of caution by simply closing things down for the moment. That was the decision of the golf club. Obviously, it wasn't the decision of Sacramento County. That was one of two counties in the state that never stopped playing golf at, at the height, uh, you know, at the height of the panic over over COVID-19. Um, so, but again, it's it's a tiny, it's the tiniest of red flags. It's something to pay attention to. And if that were to happen, perhaps in one of the more sensitive counties, as we've heard earlier today, San Francisco would be among them. There are others um, that could. Uh, that could cause a cascade of problems. So my recommendation to everyone on this call is to always stay close and in touch with public health officers and departments. I, I know uh, that's been an incredible challenge. I almost envy my counterparts in other states because then they've, they've been able to go through one executive office known as the governor, as opposed to 58 different uh, you know, county halls of administration, which have different profiles, different, different elected leaders, different politics. Um, and so forth, and different approaches uh, to, to be, because the audience is different that you're talking to. So um, cross, keep your fingers crossed. And I think, you know, you mentioned Dr. Mattias, and I thought a couple of weeks ago when he was on this uh, broadcast, I thought he gave the best um, explanation of policy being made as the intersection of science or what he does for a living and politics and what he meant by politics was not backroom politics what he meant was that public policy decisions like this while they're primarily informed by science and evidence are not a hundred percent informed there are other factors and public policy makers ultimately have to take all of those factors into consideration so, and that's my way of segueing to probably the, maybe the, what I think is the upshot of your question is that it isn't just entirely a numbers game. It may have been at the beginning of this crisis because there was a sense that this could go completely off the rails and out of control and it had to be brought under control. But in those 10, in the last 15 weeks, we have, not we, epidemiologists and scientists have learned a great deal They've learned that some of the things they understood about COVID-19 have been confirmed, but many others have not, and then further questions have been raised. So um, it's a, it's a crapshoot. I mean, it's very ambiguous, and I know that particularly for whether you're a GM, whether you're a golf course superintendent, whether you run a facility, I, I, I've said this so many times, you're looking for definitive black letter law answers. Do I, in, under, under circumstance A, what do I do? What do I do? What can I not do? And so forth. And I know it can be frustrating when the answer is as, as extended as this. And that's why I keep bringing everyone back. And I'm glad to hear Dr. Matias is a wise man. And I'm glad to hear that he put it that way to you. Just go back to the first principles. Go back to the, to the ends we're trying to accomplish with all of these rules. And that, that is, is keeping people separate from each other and not sneezing or coughing or talking loud on each with in close proximity and trying as much as possible it's impossible to be a hundred percent that those things that they that that they're not touching a lot of things in common particularly in an enclosed space and don't forget one of the things that epidemiologists have learned that they didn't know 10 12 weeks ago is that covid 19's propensity to be spread from human to human is considerably greater indoors than it is outdoors. And again, this is another one of these, of these factors about our game played on, you know, 400, 500 yards expanses uh, and with, with four persons who can stay separated from each other and can handle, and we have technologies with pool noodles and so forth, that can handle people not even having to bend over into the same hole. So that we're lucky in that regard. And so keep that in mind. Now lessons uh, have to take place on a driving range or in somewhere like that. And again, that's just duplicate what you, as, to the greatest degree possible, what you're able to do out on a golf course, on a practice range and monitor that. 
and you're probably on very, very solid ground. I hope that answered your question and then some. Thank you, Craig. And I will say for everyone there, please, please be sure to stay close to the back to golf guidelines as that have they have certainly they they are superseded by any local state county or city guidelines but they have been the basis uh, all around the state and and the country uh, in terms of assisting those not necessarily in the golf industry who are writing the protocols and understanding uh, the issues and understanding the solutions to those issues so they've been very very effective that way and we're grateful for that as it was such an amazing industry initiative so nikki any any questions for craig uh, none right now. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, thanks, Nikki. Uh, Craig, thank you. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer for the Southern California PJ, Mr. Tom Addis. Tom? Yeah, thanks, Lynn, and, and thanks to everybody. Uh, just a couple of comments, if I may. A uh, couple things that Craig mentioned. You know, we've, we've used the, the term responsible, the word responsible on numerous occasions, and our responsibility that we must maintain through all of this. I, I liked what Craig mentioned also that um, two words, uh, to pay attention. Uh, I think that's really valuable advice that we all uh, should heed, uh, is pay attention to what we're doing, pay attention to what others are doing, uh, because we're out there leading the way. Our golf courses, our golf facilities, and that's what's been said over and over and over again, and the recognition uh, as an outdoor activity, uh, we are setting a great example and uh, we need to continue to do that. And we can do that by being responsible, as we said, and by paying attention to what's going on around us, uh, best practices, um, uh, even the things we need to correct, we need to pay attention to. The other thing that, that struck me is uh, when Craig said, wish we had a singular relationship with, with agencies, uh, but that's so important out there and county by county and city by city that all of us, uh, whether we're at our golf course or golf facility, uh, get to know our uh, local governance, get to know the health officer, get to know these, these uh, community leaders, because it's during this time uh, that you can work with these leaders uh, in order to, uh, sure, prove what we do, prove that what we are doing uh, sets an example, uh, and I would I would just strongly recommend uh, going forward because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, with everything that's going on with with now with the the spikes, and we just don't know. Uh, so I, I would just say again, pay attention, develop these relationships, which is going to be uh, better for everyone, better for your facility, and uh, and so important. So uh, thanks to Barry and Jeff. Uh, and Craig, as usual, uh, Dee Dee and Tony, and, and Nikki and Bryce, thanks for uh, doing what you do. Uh, and uh, Len, always, uh, next week, I want to make a comment about uh, one of our guests. Uh, and we're having uh, Mike Davis, who's the executive director, CEO of the United States Golf Association next week, uh, along with uh, a doctor, Dr. John Landsberger, uh, who's a retired uh, uh, physician. Uh, who is a COVID-19 expert, and uh, he is on the COVID task force, among other things, here in Southern California uh, and with various hospitals. So that should be uh, very eye-opening, and I'm just, I'm going to leave it with that in conversations with him over the past few days, uh, distancing is the most important thing that we can do, uh, along with not touching our face. He was really uh, explicit in his uh, conversation about that, and, and I believe he will be next week as well, but definitely eight to 10 feet, uh, definitely, uh, and uh, that's critical. And then not touching your eyes, not touching your mouth, because those are very sensitive areas that are very susceptible, and I hope I'm saying this right, to uh, the virus. So those are the kinds of things that I think we'll hear from Dr. Landsberger next week. Uh, and of course, uh, it'll be fun to have Mike Davis as well. So Len, thanks again. And thanks again to everybody. Uh, thanks for everybody for being here and uh, look forward to this uh, next week. Thanks, Len. Okay.
Okay, thank you, Tom. And and uh, as you mentioned, Barry, thank you for being with us today for everything that that's, uh, has been going on and uh, the pivot. And we look forward to a great championship uh, in about six weeks or so. Jeff, thank you so much for keeping us in tune with what's happening around the certainly Nevada and California, but around the country as well, and for everything that the that the superintendents are doing to keep us uh, keep us in business and to keep us safe and still providing just an absolute a tremendous experience for our customers and members and, and colleagues. And Craig, thank you, you and Kevin, for keeping us abreast of, of the myriad of, of negotiations, if you will, that are coming out of, of Sacramento and of Carson City, that we're in really good hands there. Uh, Tom, we look forward to Dr. Landsberger and certainly Mr. Davis next week as we continue on. And to everyone, uh, please be safe. And uh, as Tom mentioned, you know, we've come to the phrase, be responsible now. And our kudos, as we've said, in visiting facilities around our section, around our state, the effort that everyone is putting forward in adhering to the guidelines in so many individual cases and in so many individual ways to keep the game glowing and keep the game growing and to keep the game uh, flourishing. So this is a, a team effort beyond the, any of that uh, probably most of us have experienced and the industry effort coming together in the creation of the back to golf guidelines and and say so uh, also a, a shameless plug can't let that opportunity go by next sunday is our semi-annual meeting here in the northern california pga so for those that are on the on the chat today please be sure to sign up for that uh, our virtual meeting next week uh, it's going to be terrific so everyone again uh, thank you for participating thank you for for the comments the questions for staying close uh, for keeping us the professional organization that we are. Please be safe, please be responsible, and enjoy the weekend. See you, everyone.